So the sermon today is titled Lust, uh, Life and Dust in God's Garden. Life and Dust in God's Garden. This is taken from Genesis 2, 5 to 17. And so last week we saw that after God created the universe, he began to create the land for man to live in. And uh, this land would turn into a fruitful garden. And so uh, my question today is, do you find your life meaningful? Do you have two life with God? Right? Because down in verse 8, we are told that the Lord God planted a garden in Eden. And so what kind of a garden is this exactly? Uh, we're going to see what kind of garden this is. Uh, this is amazing, okay? So from our passage, we'll see that the garden God made was a life of, uh, uh, a place of life and intimacy. Sorry, I'm distracted. A, li- a place of life and intimacy. Number two, a place of beauty and abundance. And number three, a place of work and freedom. So a place of life and intimacy, a place of beauty and abundance, a place of work and freedom. Number one, a place of life and intimacy. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the heavens, the earth and the heavens, when no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land. And there was no man to work the ground, and a midst was going up from the land, and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the bread of life. And the, bre- and the man became a living creature. Now after God finished creating everything, he rested in verse 2. Uh, and Moses here in verse 4 is saying that the Israelites would know that the Lord, Yahweh, created everything. As I mentioned last week, this was written by Moses. Genesis is one of the first five books, the first five books of Moses, namely the Torah or the Pentateuch. And so Moses is writing from that context, he's explaining this to the Israelites, right? And so here in verse 5, it says that when there was no bush or small plant yet, before the Lord God had caused rain and no man was there to work the ground, what did God do? Uh, verse 6 says there was natural moisturizer from the ground, right? Some of you ladies love moisturizers to keep your skin, dry skin from right, getting too dry, right? And cracking. Uh, so here is a natural moisturizer, a mist rising from the ground in creation even before water, uh, rain had come down from heaven. And so I want us to see here again that I think God wants us to see that He is self-sufficient. He is a self-sufficient God who provides everything. God wants us to see that He needed no help in creating the universe and this planet. And so verse 7 says now, The Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the bread of life, and the man became a living creature. Notice the word formed, uh, yasar in Hebrew, which talks about the work of an artist, right? Like a potter who shapes an earthen pot, God formed the man of dust from the ground, right? Do you see how unique, delicate, fragile, and dependent God made us to be? See, you are a beautiful piece of artwork. Uh, You are uniquely made in God's image from the dust of the ground. Because notice the Hebrew word for man is Adam. That's where we get Adam's name, which is related to the word for ground in Hebrew, which is Adama. So Adam literally came out of the ground, from the dust of the ground. That's where we get Adam's name. Uh, Later in chapter 13, verse 16, God said to Abraham, I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. But Adam is still not moving. There is no life in him, in him yet, right? His brain is dead. His lungs are not breathing. And so let me say this uh, years ago. So many of you know that my wife used to work at a, at a kindergarten. Uh, and she said this to one, uh, her students 
after God made Adam from the dust, he breathed on him. So why do you think God did that? She said last. And Sotaro Kun, one of our students, replied, to blow away the dust? So I thought, the very imaginative kid, right? Uh, so why, what does God do here? God breathed into his nostrils the bread of life. Uh, remember that there were no boogers yet with pure air at the time. He breathed into his nostrils. Remember, this, is, this, is, this was not CPR done in the mouth by closing the nostrils and still disgusting if the person didn't brush his teeth that morning. But this was a divine breath. This was the breath of life, right? It was the very life of God himself. See, long before civilization, long before the rise of modern science and medicine, where did the idea of CPR come from? God breathed into Adam the breath of life. And so there is this instinct, even in human beings, we are made in the imago Dei, the image of God. That's why we have this idea of resuscitating a, a, a body that is uh, lying down there and you give a CPR, right? And so, but this is different. This is spiritual life injected into man. It says man became a living creature. Do you remember how Adam was made in God's image in chapter 127? See, without the bread of life, man eventually returns to dust. Notice the word breath. That is God's breath in the spirit of man, right? Man literally became a living soul, not just clay pot, right? It means we are clay pots with a soul. Man is a spiritual being made to commune with God, to made to fellowship with God. This is why I asked in the beginning, do you have true life with God? I do not mean, yes, life as you are breathing right now. I'm talking about the spiritual life injected in you, infused in you by the Spirit of God, right? Because until we are re reunited with God who made us, we will seek to fill that emptiness, that void that we have in all the wrong places. Loneliness is really homesickness for God. It's a deep longing that only life with God can fulfill. And I mean vital spiritual life. Loneliness is a homesickness for God. See, life is received, we see here. The bread of life was given. Man from the beginning was made to be completely dependent on God. Incredible, right? Even the life and the air that you're breathing right now belongs to God. It comes from God. Life itself, the fact that you got up in the morning this morning and got to see another day was a gift of God. Life is received. It's a gift. It cannot be purchased. Right? So you know this. When we have a saying back home, I come from 90% Christian community, as you often hear. We have a saying back home that sometimes... We see the rich and the powerful people stack up a lot of money for an entire life so that they can live securely and cancer hits them and they spend all of their money in chemotherapy and expensive medicines with no cure. We've seen this happen in our community over and over and over again. Right? Life is a gift from God. When was the last time you simply sat down to enjoy life in God's presence? God's presence. Do you sense God's presence as a Christian? Or is your Christian life dry? Is it, does it feel like it's just a clay pot without the bread of God? Right? See, to simply breathe itself is a gift. Even the free air we are breathing right now in this room and the lungs that are breathing is a gift of God's grace. Right? COVID-19 hit us and we have to wear our masks now. People who are having to work in difficult places have to wear masks and they, there's not enough oxygen that they are breathing because they're breathing through a mask. Anything can take away the, breath, the fresh air that we're breathing right now. So life is a gift, right? The free air is God's gift. The lungs that are breathing is a gift of grace. Whenever the plug is pulled, you breathe your final breath and you don't know when that moment is going to be. Life from the beginning was never in our hands. It was in God's hands. It was God who breathed life into us. So the garden was a place of breathing, not just fresh air. God was one, just one breath away. 
Adam had unlimited access and communion with God. No sin to separate him from the life-giving power of God. No self-centeredness to prevent him from enjoying God. Do you believe, do you enjoy this life with your Creator? Because this is why God created us. God made the woman later, and he made man to have a close relationship with God. Before he made man, woman, he made the man to be a life-giving soul, to be in communion with God. Right? In other words, a Christian life is a life that is called even to walk with God alone. Right? It's amazing. Even when you're alone, God is there. He made us to have this close, vital relationship in, with Him. Man was not made to be self-centered, but God-centered. See, meism is all about me. It's me, myself, and I. Right? Me loves myself, myself loves I. And it's a problem. Because <laughs> you're trapped. <laughs> it's me, myself, and I. That's meism. The, the air that we are breathing. But that is not how God made us to be. God made us to breathe His air, breathe His spiritual life, right? To have this connection with God. Everything in God's creation, the universe, the galaxies, the waters, the plants, the bushes, the rain, were made to show us God's glory in chapter 1 and His goodness. We saw that last week. God made us to walk closely with Him for His glory. We were made to have these life-giving conversations with God as we will see next week in chapter 3. So, Next we see that the garden was also a place of beauty and abundance. A place of beauty and abundance. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made, no, uh, made to spring, ev spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided into four uh, rivers. And the name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. Wow, there was gold. And the gold, verse 12, of that land is good. Delium and onyx stone are there. We'll come back to that. The name of the sacred river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Notice how verse 8 says that the Lord God planted a garden in Eden. And there he put a man whom he had formed. Now the Greek translation of the word Eden in English is paradise. Uh, in Hebrew it means a place of delight. Right? Did you get that? In Hebrew it's a place of delight. Uh, right? The garden in Eden was a delightful garden, full of fruit trees, rivers, gold and gemstones. It was the perfect home for man. Right? This was the perfect place of refuge, rest, purpose, meaning, pleasure and abundance. Uh, this was a place where there is no sickness, no evil, no injustice, no death or diseases or decay. This was a place of beauty and abundance. And this is the perfect world that we are all longing for, isn't it? So verse 9 says, Out of the ground the Lord God made up to spring, to so spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight. Now, pause with me. When you look at the sakura trees during the spring, it's beautiful, isn't it? I love the sakura trees in Japan. Spring is coming. And it's going to be beautiful again. Why are we naturally drawn to the trees? God created us here, look, to enjoy His beauty in the trees. Different trees that are pleasant to the eyes in different seasons, right? Back in chapter 1, you remember last week, God made seasons so that the trees change their color in the fall, summer, and spring. And the beauty of the trees are there to really deepen our enjoyment of God. When you look at sakura trees in Japan in spring, you're not made to just see sakura trees. You're made to see God's creativity and design and artistry in sakura trees and enrich your soul with that. That is how a Christian enjoys creation. Non-Christians enjoy creation for the sake of creation. They idolize creation and worship the creation rather than the creator, says Romans 1. 
Christians go beyond that to the God who made everything and they are able to commune with God. One of the most natural ways God nourishes the human soul is to the creative work of his creation, to the beauty of his magnificence displayed in the heavens. The heavens declare the glory of God. The scribes proclaim his handiwork. It is his. It points to him. Right? And sakura trees are there to show us the beauty of the creator, the designer of everything. Right? They are there to nourish our souls. To quiet us down, to slow us down, to awaken in us a life of contemplation, contemplation on His sovereignty, His creativity, His beauty, His magnificency. They are there to awaken our eyes. So we were not made to be self centered, always looking at ourselves, always looking back at our failures and mistakes, always feeling sorry for ourselves, always living in self pity. Sin makes you look at yourself all the time. Sin is by nature self centered, it is always self seeking. Sin makes you look inward, right? But God made all of these things around us so that we will look away from ourselves frequently to the beauty of God's design, His goodness, His life, and, and the abundance that He has provided for us. No artist can come close to the beauty of God we see in creation. Next time you go on a vacation or a trip, look at God's goodness. Enjoy God's goodness in the trees. We're going to see in a minute. God made us to look away from ourselves to Him, to His creation, to be ravished by His beauty, to be ravished by uh, His grandeur. He did not make us to be preoccupied with self. So before God put the man to work, He put him to enjoy every pleasant trees, pleasant to the eye. So question for you, how often do you slow down to look away to the beauty of nature. How often do you slow down to look away from yourself to the beauty of nature? Often I know it's hard, life in the city is fast-paced, right? So let me say this to you, everything is fast. Fast food, fast cars, fast trains, fast sex, fast machines, fast internet, fast video games, pichu, pichu, pichu. Fast pachinko, bling, 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 bling. Uh, fast action movies, uh, instant messages, bling, bling, bling. Fast texting, chik, 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 chik. fast payment, bling, bling. Uh, credit cards, fast news advertisements, fast advertisements flashing across the big screens in Shibuya and in Ginza. We live in a hurried, digitally saturated world of distractions that are not meant to keep our eyes off of on, on God and His beauty and His creation. This is by nature satanic design to keep us preoccupied, right? They are not there. Many of them are good things in and of themselves, but that's how the heart idolizes good things, right? If you're always in a rush, you miss God's beauty. See, if I'm in a rush, if I'm running, right? Here, I cannot see, this is blurry. I don't have time to pause this one. I'm running. I'm in a hurry. So, but if I slow down and I look and I look and I said, oh, wait, wait. Ah, seeing something. Oh, wait. Verse 8 says this. Oh, wait. Wait a minute. One sec. Let's zoom out a little bit. Oh, wait. Verse 14 says this. But how about, oh, let's zoom in. Let's verse 9. Wait, I haven't seen that word before. Wow, that opens up the world of God for me. That's how I study my Bible. Zoom in. Zoom out. Look at the words. Let's turn up the stone here. Garden, let's turn it up. Okay, let's see what's underneath this one. Wow, it's not just garden. Wow, this is garden in Eden. Eden is delight in Hebrew. I'm discovering God's world. That's how we were made, for, what we were made for. To pause. But if you're in a hurry, you just read the surface text. You think your Bible reading is done. You have only begun to scratch the surface. There is a vast ocean of God's wisdom. You need to take your oxygen tank and dive in there. If your tank runs out, He will provide the oxygen. <laughs> this is imagery I'm using. Dive in, don't swim at the surface. Go, it's turn, out, turn, 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 out, turn over the stones, the gems, 
that lies there, the gold that lies there, right? See, God made us to look away from ourselves to His beauty. Do you frequently slow down to inhale and exhale just to enjoy God's design in nature? There is no canvas painting as beautiful as God's design. There is no, when you go to an art gallery, the art gallery is not made for you to idolize the art and idolize the artist. It's there to point you to the ultimate artist, the creator God. God's creativity. The artist will have no way to create art if he was not made in the Imago Dei, the image of God. <laughs> this is amazing, right? You're a Christian. You connect to the world differently. There is no garden as lush, green, colorful, rich in food, and life-giving as the garden in Indian Eden. This spring, if you ever go to a beautiful park, pause for a moment to think about the Garden of Eden and the paradise that God has created. The garden, any garden you see in Tokyo is meant to point you to the ultimate garden, right? This is paradise which God made. It says there was a tree, there was, the tree was also good for food. Look, man didn't need a growth. You see your work at, as God sees it? This is important. Whatever work Adam did was a service to God. It means no work is ordinary if you think gardening is boring, right? Right? Yeah. <laughs> right? If you think gardening is boring, boring, here is the good news. God is a gardener. He created a garden. Yeah? And he put Adam to work in a garden. S uh, sure, life was perfect back then, but your work has a higher purpose. See, working at a famous company is not more significant in God's eyes than gardening. If it's done for God, no little work is ordinary. No work is too small if we see work as God sees it. You need to see your work as God sees it, not as man sees it. Because when you see your work as man sees it, you compare. Oh, gardening, this is like not so significant, yeah? Your peers are not going to say, hey, Aaron, what a great garden you got, you know. They may say that, but they are thinking, oh, well, I work in an IT company, you know. <laughs> you see, your sense of word is derived, and your value is derived from the work you do, because that's a distorted version of what work is, right? Sin distorted that. In God's garden, Adam had this best garden in the world. <laughs> Right? And he's a gardener. He put there to where no work is insignificant if it's done for God. No work is too small if you see work as God sees it. And notice, there was no overwork, by the way. Because God is the perfect boss who will not overwork you or underwork you. He himself rested on the seventh day in verse 2. He came up with this rhythm of work and rest. And so what happens when you idolize your work? You'll sacrifice your friends and family on the altar of your work. Because many people say, oh, these religious people, you know, they make sacrifices and they criticize religion. But, you know, if you're a non-religious non person and you worship your work, you know, you're as religious as those religious people you are criticizing. You're just changing religion. Work's be work becomes your religion. And then you create an altar, which is your work, and you sacrifice your friends, your family, and everyone else on the altar of your work. And your work will continue to demand sacrifice on you until you die of karoshi. Do you see this? Until you overwork yourself to death. Because false gods are cruel. They will, they will promise you more than they can deliver. So how many of you know that in Japan, people die of karoshi, death by overwork? What happened to the world where there's no evil, suffering, and death? Notice, out of all the trees, only one tree was forbidden. Verse 17. Many modern people ask, why did God put the forbidden tree? Because modern people assume that true freedom is without restrictions. Many modern people think that true freedom means there is no restriction. I can do whatever I want. There is no rule. I'm the only one who makes up the rules. That's what modern people believe to be about freedom. We feel that any restriction is a hindrance to our personal freedom. Many modern people assume that God is a restrictive, restrictive tyrant. 
They assume that God is a narrow-minded, demanding God who holds back our freedom. But that is an imaginary God. That is not the God of the Bible. Many people assume church and Christianity is like a small aquarium with restrictive boundaries. right? But that's not what we see here. God's garden was a place of bread. It was a place of where there was life to its fullest, a place of beauty, a place of human flourishing and abundance, all for free. God's grace was there, unearned. How many of you know that a fish out of the aquarium dies eventually? Yeah? Imagine a fish swimming freely in the vast ocean, not the aquarium. The fish can enjoy boundless freedom in the vast and deep ocean. But if a fish comes out of the ocean onto the beach, what happens? The fish dies. That's what God did here. He gave man to enjoy everything. He gave him dominion over all the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and living things on earth in chapter 1. And here he gave him a lush green fruitful garden to care for it with everything and every food and every beautiful thing in there, life of abundance. And Adam could freely choose from all the trees. God says, from all the trees you can choose. Look at the text carefully. Right? You may surely eat of every tree of the garden. God is so generous. He's not restrictive. He's not stingy. He doesn't hold back. You may eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of evil, good and evil. One tree was restricted. For in the day of it, you shall surely die. God wants voluntary obedience, right? Man could live a fulfilling and blissful life. Adam could freely choose from all the trees, including tree of life. But only tree was forbidden. Why? Why did God forbid that one? Well, not to restrict man's freedom, but to give him the freedom of a choice. <laughs> to give him a freedom of choice. That's why. So. God wants voluntary obedience, for in the day of it you shall surely eat of it, you shall surely die. Now many people think, if only everything goes my way, if life goes my way, then I will be free and satisfied. It's not true. Adam had a perfect world. He had his own way and destroyed that perfect world by his one choice. For in that day he ate of the tree, right? Adam brought death. For in the day that he ate of the tree, Adam brought death. He experienced death. He experienced separation from God. Sin, evil, death, sweat, decay and disease, thorns and thistles, destruction and chaos entered into the world. Adam chose freely the tree of death instead of the tree of life. We became separated from God because of Adam. See, Adam could not keep one command and brought death. His obedience separated us from God. This is why we are always searching for a true home like strangers in the world. As C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, said, quote, If I find myself in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. If I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. Of course, God made a perfect world and it was destroyed by sin. That's why we are longing for this perfect world, right? This is why we are always longing for the ultimate relationship that no human relationship ultimately fulfills except with God. Later in chapter 3, 19, God said to Adam, quote, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. Listen to this. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Look, out of the dust of the ground came Adam. To dust we return to the ground. Until we, we are reunited with God, we will not find true life. With our final breath, we will return to dust and be buried in the ground. We ourselves return to the ground. But that is why Jesus came. Look at this with me. 1 Corinthians 15, 14. Paul, looking back at the time of creation of man, says this. The first man was from the dust, from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. Who is the second man? Jesus is the second man from heaven who lived the perfect life we could not live. 
He died the death we should have died. And out of the dust of the grave, Jesus rose again. Look, in Adam we are all dusty people. We decompose when we die. But because of Jesus, we rise to become heavenly people. Right? Do you see how the Old Testament connects with the New? Do you see how Jesus is seen? In, especially with Paul looking back. We need to see the Old Testament the way the New Testament writers saw it. Right? Paul looking back at the time of creation of the man of dust. He says, the first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven, Jesus Christ. Right? In Adam, we are all dusty people. We decompose when we die, we decay. But because of Jesus, we rise to become a heavenly people. And Daniel, in his prophetic vision, saw our future resurrection and said this, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth, right? Notice, sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to everlasting contempt. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth, a man of dust, Adam, right? We decompose and we die. We go back to dust in the ground. We sleep in the dust of the earth. But when Christ returns, he says, the dust of the earth, people who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Remember that it's not just Christians who will rise to face Jesus Christ. Non-Christians will rise to face Jesus Christ, some to shame and everlasting contempt, he says. The gospel is both ways. One to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And so if you are in Christ today, you will rise to everlasting life. Dust and decay are now things of the past because of Jesus. If you are not yet a Christian, I invite you to trust Christ so that you will not face shame and everlasting contempt. So that you can, you too can rise to everlasting life if you come to Christ. Paul, looking at our future resurrection, says this again in 1 Corinthians 15, 49. Just as we have be borne the image of the man of dust, notice carefully, the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven, he says. Right? Just as we have borne the image of the man of the dust, Adam, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. If you are a believer, your future, future depends not on the man of the dust, but on the man of heaven who came out of the tomb. You will bear his image. One day we will be transformed into his likeness. And so because of Jesus, listen, paradise lost will become paradise restored. Revelations 20, 22, 21, 22, we see there the tree of life. What was the tree of life there for in Revelations 22? Do you know? The leaves were for the healing of the nations. Paradise lost, paradise restored when Jesus Christ returns. In other words, all of this beauty and the garden that we see, the paradise, is where we will be. Let me spoil it for you from our Luke sermon series that's going to come, okay? Here's spoiler alert. This is what the man on the cross said, right? The man from heaven hung on the cross and to his other side there was another thief that was hanging on the cross. What did he say to the thief? Today, you will be with me, where? Paradise. Paradise restored. <laughs> the man of the dust lost the paradise. The man from heaven will restore paradise. Today, you will be with me on paradise. So come to him. Sin, death, and decay will no longer corrupt you on that day when you rise with Jesus Christ. Come to him today. Walk with him in the freedom that he has called you. Would you stand as we close in prayer?